Hello everyone, welcome to today's Novage webinar, BIM Workflows and BIM Objects in Grasshopper. This webinar will show how the different ways VisualArc integrates with Grasshopper and the unlimited possibilities this combination of tools offers. Today you will see how to automate design modeling workflows using BIM objects in Grasshopper, or how to manage data on geometry, and how to create your own custom parametric BIM objects as visual arc styles, among other things, uh, packed with contents today. And today's webinar presenter, Frances Salla, is an architect and product manager of visual arc and land design, the two main products of Asuni and he's doing that since 2010. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Novage, where you can find both Visual Arc, Lens Design, and Rhino. Novage is changing the way designers purchase three software, offer more choices, as you can see, more freedom, best advice, and faster service. Check us out at novage.com. Now, I'll share Francesc's screen. Take it away, Francesc. Okay, thank you very much, Barbara, for this introduction. I'm gonna play this uh, presentation where I will show you, you know, these game workflows with Rhino, Visual Arc, and Grasshopper. So as you may know, Rhino is a software for modeling 3D with amazing uh, capabilities to work with freeform shapes and uh, also other uh, kind of geometry. But uh, well, the geometry lacks from data, so it's not a beam software, but by itself. Of course, uh, we've got Grasshopper that lets us automate, you know, uh, parametric design processes. Uh, Grasshopper is an algorithm uh, editor, a visual algorithm editor, uh, which lets us, you know, create amazing stuff uh, combining uh, geometry, numeric values, and uh, operations in a very uh, user-friendly way. So, uh, in between these two amazing tools, we've got Visual Arc to add flexible beam features to, to both of them. All right, and that's what I'm gonna uh, talk uh, today, the ways Visual Art integrates with Rhino and, and Grasshopper. Um, well, Visual Art adds flexible beam features to Rhino. It's used to uh, produce 3D models in Rhino and also produce 2D drawings. And uh, well, besides these 3D modeling tools, the tools to produce documentation, it also provides tools to exchange Rhino models through, uh, through IFC to other with other uh, software in the AEC uh, industry. All right. So since we are uh, working with objects with data uh, provided by Visual Arc, we're able to export these objects uh, through IFC. So basically, um, it provides a set of architectural objects. They are parametric, and uh, we can easily edit them through parameters. Okay. Uh, they have also some um, some features in 3D that uh, also we can see in, in Plan B, we, we have different uh, visualization modes, okay? And um, this lets us show the model in Plan Views very quickly, but also work in, in 3D, all right? And we can also uh, work with them through, edit them through control points as native Rhino objects. Um, and these objects already have some, uh, let's say, native features, but they are a little bit limited, okay? So in order to cope with this limitation, visual art objects can be also created from grasshopper definitions, allowing any uh, unlimited possibilities to create objects, parametric objects with no limits of uh, detail or uh, parametric designs. I will show you uh, how it works later, later on. And also we can find all the visual art objects available as components into the grasshopper uh, interface. So we can uh, include uh, these visual art beam objects within our uh, parametric designs, all right? So, um, these two ways of integration, uh, of how Visual Arc integrates with Grasshopper makes Visual Arc a flexible beam tool, and we'll see some examples uh, now, okay? On one hand, we've got the option to create these beam objects from Grasshopper definitions. On the other hand, we can use these objects into the Grasshopper uh, interface. Uh, in order to, uh, to go on with this integration, I would like to explain the, well, the hierarchy of these uh, visual art objects, okay, how, uh, how they are uh, created. So on one hand, we have object types, such as walls, curtain walls, doors, windows, slabs, stairs, and so on, all right? 
So within each object type, we have uh, some styles. And these styles define the features of these objects. For example, in the case of doors, the styles define uh, the number of lifts, the profile of the opening, the, the aperture type, okay, the dimensions of the different components, just the frame, the lift frame, the smullions. Uh, well, we've got all these parameters available as uh, style properties. Okay, we can only edit them uh, from, from styles. Actually, we can see here the styles dialog from where we can select like the general hinged glass in this case. And from the right side, we can change uh, the different par style parameters, such as the profile, okay, or uh, other, other dimensions for the uh, other components. Uh, within each style, we can have a list of sizes, okay, so we can quickly um, select one style or another, uh, sorry, one size or another uh, from the same style. It's an easy way to uh, store different sizes to switch from one size or another. So here you can see uh, well the dialog from where you can create new sizes for a one style. This is available for certain object types, such as openings or uh, beams and columns. And finally, we've got the, uh, the, the, the instances, okay? The physical elements we've got in the model, then uh, that they can take one style or another. Right, and we can edit them from the properties panel, okay, just by selecting them and changing different properties, such as the style or the, um, well, the dimensions. And you can notice here that when we do any change, the volume, the area, the properties of this object is recalculated. And since we are working with object with data, we'll be able to list this data uh, afterwards. So this is another example with wall objects. We've got here the, um, the styles dialog for walls. In that case, uh, walls have components which correspond to the, to the layers, to the wall layers. But we can have uh, also different walls of the same size and uh, each one having uh, different heights. Or in this case, we can have windows of the same style and each one of them having different sizes. Okay. Um, well, in addition to the properties, to the native properties uh, objects have, we can add custom data to, to geometry. They are uh, called parameters and they could be static data. Okay, so we can fit geometry with data, not only visual art objects, but Rhino geometry. And uh, well, this data will be stored into geometry when we export that object to IFC. And this data also can be managed from Grasshopper, as we will see in a, in a while. So the idea of creating objects, parametric objects, um, especially those that can be created from Grasshopper definitions, let us, you know, having uh, multiple uh, objects of the same style, all of them with different dimensions, all right? And in the case of uh, objects driven by grasshopper definitions, we use just one grasshopper file for generating unlimited, uh, you know, um, objects with different dimensions. Actually, in Food for Rhino, there is a, well, a library of uh, free objects that you can uh, download, all right? And most of them are created from Grasshopper definitions. Uh, you don't need to know Grasshopper at this point because you just need to download them as a VAL file, and then you can import them as new styles in your document. And at this point, you see the, the objects as uh, new objects, but not necessarily, necessarily, uh, and there is no need to open a Grasshopper. You know, Grasshopper just runs in the background. Um, now, in order to understand how these objects work, we need to also understand the, their uh, input geometry. Okay. In the case of walls, curtain walls, beams, railings, or uh, stairs, we require a path curve. Okay. Uh, in the case of roofs or uh, slabs, they require a boundary curve or a surface. In the case of openings, we need uh, an insert point, but also um, additionally a wall or a curtain wall as hosts. Okay. This is an option. This is uh, optional. And for furnishing elements, elements or columns or annotation objects, we just need an insert point, okay? In the case of spaces, it's similar as uh, slabs, so we need a boundary curve uh, or uh, surfaces, or we can also insert them from in, from a point that will detect, you know, uh, architectural elements and will calculate the area uh, automatically. In the case of sections, they are created from, from lines and section views and plan views just uh, require an insert point. Tags and uh, Quantitative curves, they are uh, not available in Grasshopper, but we have them in, in Rhino. Um, well, talking about the visual art components available in Grasshopper, 
we've got some components that are used to create objects, okay? Um, some are components to create new styles, and then we've got also components to deconstruct them. So not only visual art objects, okay, but also the styles information. And using these components, we can obtain any uh, information required for using these components, also with other other uh, uh, add-ons in, in Grasshopper and doing amazing, amazing stuff. This is just an example of a parametric tower where everything is used, uh, created with columns, visual art columns and slabs. Also, we've got some components that can be used to, uh, well, to manage data on geometry. For example, in this case, we um, uh, reference this list of columns and we name them with a with a, a list of names okay automatic naming we'll see an example of that later later on um, also we can use the visual objects in grasshopper definitions for the grasshopper player as you may know this is a command in rhino that lets us uh, select a grasshopper file which will run as a command in rhino we just need to follow the steps in the command line okay to uh, well produce a stuff uh, generated by this grasshopper definition and somebody with who doesn't know grasshopper can also use that because they just need to follow the steps in the command line all right in this case everything that here is generated with the slabs and columns as well also the visual art components uh, allows the integration of uh, uh, visual art inside Revit workflow as you may know the run inside technology lets you run rhino and the, the, the plugins like uh, Visual Arc, also Grasshopper, as plugins for, for Revit. So in this case, we've got Rhino running from, from Revit, and uh, there is uh, a Grasshopper definition here running in the background, background, which references all the Visual Arc objects. It takes that information and uses them to uh, reproduce everything in Revit using, uh, well, Revit aware components in Grasshopper. Okay, we have a live connection where we have full control of what we want to send to from Rhino to Revit and which information we want to uh, send also within the visual objects. Uh, the key point here is that when we select uh, these objects in Revit, they are true Revit objects. Well, in the visual art website, you have plenty of learning resources okay, to, uh, to work with these Grasshopper components. Few uh, exercises, getting started exercises. And also there are some tutorials for uh, creating new uh, visual art styles, okay? You can explore this, uh, this material on the, on the visual art website. All right, so today we will see the steps to create grasshopper styles, all right? And uh, we will follow with some basic workflow to use the visual art uh, grasshopper components. Uh, we will see also examples of, of managing data on, on geometry, and if there is time, I will show some some other example. Okay, cool, cool thing. Let's let's go on with the with the demo. So I'm just gonna uh, open a, a Rhino uh, model. I will start, you know, opening by an existing model. You know, this project of the Villa Savoie, and uh, well, I will create my first. Uh, a style created from a grasshopper definition. And I will use the door uh, object for that. If we run the door styles command, I do right click here, we can see the list of uh, existing styles. We can explore them, for example, and we can see the hinged has a frame. The frame has you know, some, some information, some values. But again, this, um, the features available for uh, native visual objects are limited and we cannot produce certain designs of, uh, of doors. So I'm gonna close this, and I'm gonna show you a grasshopper definition, which generates a default door, okay? I've got it, it here, and we can see the preview of what grasshopper generates in, in here. Basically, I've got a definition that has some, some inputs, okay? They are numeric values, but they could be also lists, all right, like, like this, or even geometry. So this uh, defines the, the width of, that, uh, of the door. We've got also a value for the, for the height, another for the, for the aperture, uh, and, so, and so on. We've got another for the number of leaves, in order that determines if these leaves are blind or glazed, 
So basically, I decided which features I wanted to include in this uh, for this object. And up to here, this is just a uh, pure grasshopper components, no visual art uh, components at all here. Okay. Now, um, the key point here is that the components that collect the different parts of these objects, in order that visual art identifies them as future components for the style that we want to create, that they need to be connected with a geometry parameter. All right. So I'm going to go to geometry, select this geometry param component, and connect this, you know, this extrusion that performs the, the door frame into that geometry. And now I need to do right click and rename this component in order that Visual Arc identifies this component as a frame and, uh, well, it shows uh, the proper name. So I'm going to call this frame. Okay. I've got here another component for the door profile which is already connected to a curve. So this is going to be identified by, by visual arc as well. And this would uh, be used as the opening uh, of that door when we insert it in, in a wall. OK, so it's necessary to have a, the precise you know, uh, component for that. If we check this out, we see this component that you know, collects the geometry for the, for the lifts. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to connect this into a geometry component and name this as lifts. And I will do the same for the glasses, OK? For these surfaces that are the door glasses. I'm going to call these glasses. Finally, I've got here another curve for this arrow. This is already curved, so this is going to be identified by, by visual art. Basically, you know, geometry components are those that will be identified by visual art and not other other ones. Um, okay. Also notice that I've got these sliders, you know, grouped here. And these groups will be uh, a way to identify them later on when we select how we want to edit these parameters to the to the visual art object. Uh, all right, I save this definition. I close this and now I can go back to the door styles and here I'm going to create a new style. And just notice that here we've got the two options, uh, well, the regular door style or the one created from a grasshopper definition. I'm going to select this one. I need to you know, search for my um, grasshopper definition that generates this default door. I give it a name. I give it uh, a tell which units the definition uh, was created. And here, I need to select which one of the, you know, the, all the geometry patterns that we've got in that uh, definition acts as the uh, opening profile. Since I gave a proper name, I can now identify them uh, accordingly. I click Next. I get the rest of the other components. Click Next. Actually, let me go back one second. Uh, we can see here a model on a plan view representation. So I can have a, a group of this geometry that can be used for the plan view representation. For example, this, um, this curve that I forgot you know, to, to name them, name it with, a, with an arrow, uh, can be assigned to the plan view. But as soon as we do this, this will be taken as the only 2D representation. And we don't want that. Okay, uh, I'm going to leave it by model. And if we wanted to have a different to the representation than the one that is taken by default, which corresponds to the real section of this, you know, this uh, geometry in in plan view, uh, we would need to have a specific component in the grasshopper definition and assign it to the to the plan view to this plan representation. All right. In this next step, we can see the list of parameters we've got in in the file, the grasshopper file, and now we decide how we want to edit them in the final object. For example. In the case of the aperture, this is something that I want to edit by object, okay? meaning that I can have different doors of the same style, and each one I have a different aperture. And also, we can change the type, value type, to a percentage. Um, what I was mentioning before that we have some parameters grouped lets us, you know, uh, filter them from these uh, from these groups here. So we can select the parameters that we've got in the geometry. For example, height and width is also something that we want to edit by object okay. and filter, display them according to these filters. Also the number, numbers of 
number of leaves, something that I want to edit by object. And also, we have the option to hide specific parameters if we want that we don't want to uh, edit them at all. For example, the leaf type is something that I, I'm going to set it by definition, so I don't want to see that value in styles dialog or the properties dialog because I don't want to, to edit that. All right. Okay, I click on finish. I've got my new uh, door style as a new other style. At this point, I don't really know which one, uh, which style corresponds to a native style, and which one is created from a grasshopper definition. Um, this is important because at this point, I can share that file with somebody who has never worked with grasshopper and they can use this object generated with grasshopper. And the advantage of uh, having managed each you know, piece of geometry uh, as different components lets me select one of them, for example, the glasses, and assign here a specific uh, material, okay? Or also you could assign some specific section or uh, projection attributes. All right, I click on OK, and now I'm ready to insert that, uh, that object in my, in my model. I'm working on the ground floor. I will run the door command. I'm gonna search for this new style, the P floor. Here I can define, you know, the dimensions or the properties that I left it editable by object. So I can set here a width of two meters and finally insert that in my model. Okay. I can have com some copies of that. Maybe I will insert another one here. And just by selecting one or another, I will be able to change the parameters that again, I left editable by, by object. In this case, I'm going to uh, set the, the width to three meters, all right, or I can change the aperture to 20%. Uh, okay. All right, so this is, uh, well, the way the visual art grasshopper styles are created. Um, again, we'll have different ways of creating them according to the object types and the, the input data they, they require, okay? In the case of uh, these objects, I didn't mention that, but it's necessary, you know, that the geometry is generated on the zero coordinates, okay? Taking the middle bottom point on the, well, be located on the zero coordinates and the plane of the, you know, of the door is uh, aligned with, uh, with a vertical uh, plane, okay? along the x axis. So these are the two conditions to uh, well, make this possible. All right. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on. I'm going to I'm going to show another example of uh, visual art grasshopper style. In this case we'll create uh, I will use the generic element to create a kind of a louvers, okay, a louver system. So we'll quickly show you a definition that generates these this louvers and uh, I'm going to find it here. All right, here it is. And again, we've got a list of input parameters, okay, that define, you know, the dimensions of this object, like the width or height, okay, number of structure models in that direction. Basically, the features I wanted to edit for this for this object, okay. Or well, we got also some uh, features for the for the louvers, uh, the aperture, right? Also, we can uh, change, you know, the the, the louver profile from a rectangular or from a custom profile. I mean, we can just draw, you know, any kind of mm, profile here. Maybe I'm gonna I'm gonna make it this way. And also this curve can be, I can select this profile and you know, edit the uh, dimension of, the, of these louvers. So we have several uh, combinations here to have full control of how this object uh, it is generated. And um, well, this curve will be used later on as also a, a parameter along with the others we've got here. At the end of this definition, I've got you know a component that collects the louvers and another that collects the structure. I have already named them, and they are geometry panels. So Visual Art will identify them. Um, all right, I can close the grasshopper file. I will run 
you know, the element the styles dialog. And again, I will select this grasshopper styles option, select that grasshopper definition, and go next, okay, uh, to create that new style. In this case, the insert point corresponds to the zero uh, location of the geometry in the in the grasshopper file, so it's fine. And I've got here the two components, and then I need to uh, well tell which parameters will be editable by object or by by a style. I'm going to leave this curve also editable by objects, so we'll see how we can edit this uh, for each uh, object. Uh, actually, the lower profile is now set to ellipse, so I'm going to change it to custom profile. Okay. All right. Finally, the aperture is something that I can also set it as a percentage. I've got my lower style here. Click OK, and now I can insert it. So I look for it. And now, uh, well, I can select one or another, and each one can have a different dimension. I go to the properties of this element, and I can change uh, the width of one or another. I can change the aperture. Or I can also change the uh, all the profile. Again, we can uh, draw here a different profile. In this case, maybe I'm gonna uh, generate kind of a something like this. All right, which looks a little bit different. And since this is a, a feature that uh, a parameter that we left editable by object, we can find it here. You know, the curve that is used for the, you know, for the profile of the of these louvers. And when I click on here, I will get you know these uh, these profiles in here. All right, so um, let's move on. And now let's uh, talk about the grasshopper components. Okay, so we have seen how to create visual objects uh, from grasshopper definitions. We'll see how to insert them, these objects, in, in, in from Grasshopper. And finally, we'll see a combination of these components with those that we have created as a Grasshopper styles. So I'm going to use a new document now. And we'll see uh, the basic workflow, right? So we've got here the visual arc uh, components. For example, we have all the objects, all the architectural objects available from here. But we also have components to uh, create levels, okay. We also have components to uh, create profiles, and here we find the uh, rest of components to manage uh, data. For example, to create new parameters, uh, new document parameters. How to uh, obtain the list of parameters of an of, of an object? We can also track, uh, assign IFC types or tags to to geometry, or we can uh, well use these other components to create blocks, deconstruct the blocks, explode the visual objects so we can work with the resulting heavy reps, create hatches, text, and so on. Okay, also these commands to Boolean operations with visual objects. But let's see the basic workflow, for example, when we create a wall. So we drag and drop here a wall component, which by default, it takes a path curve and some options. And okay, if we draw you know, a curve here, and we reference it with a curve param. We can now assign that curve as the input curve of that wall component. But of course, this still has, you know, a default style and default uh, properties like the height or the alignment. If we want to change that, we need to connect here a wall options component. We plug this in here, and now we are able to assign a specific height, change the alignment, or assign a different style. Actually, the style can be mm, assigned from here, doing right click on this input. And we can set one style, or we have a specific components here on the first uh, tab, param tab, to also reference wall styles. So you do right click, I will select this set one style option. This will browse, you know, for the, uh, the list of styles available in that document. I can select maybe this one. Okay. And now I can also define the head, which can be a value that goes from one 
uh, meter to uh, to five meters. Right. Okay, so let's let's move on. For example, in this case, we've got already the path curve because we create that wall from that curve. But in some occasions, like uh, in the situation where we were referencing walls, we may want to obtain that curve. And this can be done with the uh, visual art deconstruct wall component. So basically, we find here the opposite components that you know uh, gives us the information or the geometry that has, has been used to generate these objects. So we've got here the path curve, and we can also deconstruct the wall options to obtain, uh, excuse me, deconstruct wall options to obtain the style, the alignment, height. We can see here the, the value. So we can work with these values to, to uh, well, move on with this grasshopper definition. Um, well, we can insert a few windows here. Maybe we can uh, generate an array of windows uh, here. So I'm going to use the divide curve command. Component. So I'm going to select this. I can either select this one or the one that comes up from here with a series of points that can go from one to uh, maybe 20. All right. And now I'm going to use these points to insert um, some windows. Uh, I'm going to call the first and last point of this list. So I will use this cool uh, index com uh, component. And I will just uh, generate a list of indexes that are the number zero, number minus one, which correspond you know, to the first and last points of this list. I will turn this into a multi-line data. And as a result, I get the you know inner inner points. Now I can create a, a visual arc window. I go to visual arc under windows. I've got here the window component. So I can connect this into the position, which locates the window in the right place, but not in the right uh, alignment. So uh, since this window doesn't have any host, it doesn't identify you know the proper alignment. As soon as I connect that wall as the host, the windows will be properly aligned, OK? And again, I've got these windows with some default uh, dimensions and some default uh, features. If I want to change that, I will need a window uh, options component. I'm going to connect this here, which basically has the same you know, properties as I can find when I select a window and I can edit that from the properties panel. For example, I can. Uh, use numeric slider to change the, the aperture, right? Or, um, well, I can use a profile, a rectangular profile in this case, to change their dimensions. Here is important to mention that we need to use a profile which uh, is the same than the one that is used by the style. So if I plug here a, a circular profile, okay, this will gives uh, an error, this will give an error because the, the profile assigned to the style is different than the one of these of these windows, or the one that we have connected here. So I can now set here a numeric value that goes from 0 0.4 to 3 meters, for example. This will be the width and another for the for the height. All right. OK, so I also have here full control of the number of windows. I can even create the windows from custom profiles. Here in Visual Art, we've got the option you know, to create uh, profiles from course. But if I do it from a grasshopper, I will be able to reference a curve and use that curve as my uh, custom profile. OK, this is the curve, and now uh, this custom profile can overwrite, you know, the profile assigned by style. It's the only way we can overwrite this with a different profile that, uh, than the rectangular one. So I'm going to use this profile instead. And now I can, uh, well, edit this profile by, you know, changing this curve. Okay, so, well, this is just, you know, a preview of what's going on here in Visual Arc. But if we select the windows and the, and the, the walls, and I bake those, 
I will get as a result you know, wall and, and windows that I can further edit it from, from, from visual art, okay, from the properties panel. All right, so now I would like to show an example of how to combine, you know, these grasshopper components with the style that we have created before. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna delete this, okay? And I'm gonna draw here a, a surface, imagining, this, imagining that this is a kind of the surface of a facade we want to, want to create, right? So this would be the facade that we want to populate with these uh, with these louvers, right? Simulating a kind of structural shading system uh, on here. So from Grasshopper, I'm gonna create a new document. First of all, I'm gonna reference this surface. All right, I will need to find the surface dimensions because now I'm gonna place a rectangular grid on that on that surface. Okay, go to a vector, rectangular grid. So I'm gonna take the plane of that surface and I want to have control of the number of items in one direction and on the uh, vertical direction. So I will set here two values that go from one to, let's say, uh, 20, should be enough for the extent X. Okay, this is taking the number of, a number of rows. Another for the, I will take another value for the number of uh, columns. And now I need to mm, uh, calculate, you know, the size of each uh, cell in order that it fits with these surface dimensions. So we'll need to divide this U dimension with this number of uh, items and connect this to the size X. And do the same, actually, I think it's the other, the other way around. Uh, I'll connect this, all right. And I will do the same with these other values and connect this to the Y value. So now I have full control, you know, of the um, of this rectangular cell fitting with the same dimensions of this of this surface. Okay, so we've got here the cells, we've got the points, and we're interested to obtain the points, you know, which will become the insert points for my um, for my elements. So when I create, we create here, we want to insert here some elements. The position will be those points, um, and actually, since I'm going to use this element that had, you know, the insert point from that corner, um, I will mm, will need to pull, you know, the top uh, row of points and the last uh, row a column of uh, points here. So before connecting this, I'm gonna pull. This list of points, which are already grouped by rows and columns, so probably when I connect this here, and I tell this to call, you know, the the row number zero. Okay, I'm already calling this first row, but this is not what I want. I want to call, you know, the last one. So here, instead of zero, I'm gonna set a minus one. Okay, and from this list, I'm gonna call, you know, the top list. So I'm gonna use a new call index, I connect this list. And in this case, the uh, well, the item will be number zero. I'm not sure if it starts counting from the top. We'll check it out. All right. So here, the point is that we need to flip the, you know, the, the, the grouping of these rows and columns. So now instead of selecting columns, I can select rows. So I, We'll use the flip matrix. All right. So I select, you know, uh, I can call the last, the last row of points. Actually, I'm gonna hide this. So we'll make sure that we select these points and we have called, you know, those that we don't want. All right. So we've got the the desired points. Now I can use them for the position of that element, and we just need to reference that element style that we have created. So here we've got the uh, uh, element styles. I'm gonna do right click, set one element style, 
And now we can also select this lower system. And I need to connect this to the uh, element options as we did with the wall or the window. We've got here an element options component. And we can now connect this style here and we'll get you know the uh, louvers in the desired points but of course they don't have you know the desired dimensions so we need to uh well recalculate the dimensions of this object in order that they fit you know with the dimensions of these of these cells actually these values have been already calculated we've got them here okay this is the value for the um well, this is the wider value. So this probably is the value for the for the height. Maybe we can call this height in order that I can identify it properly later on. Um, this is the health, uh, the cell height and the cell width. And um, well, we just need to uh, change the property, one of the properties of this object in order to fit with these dimensions. But we don't know which property it is. In order to identify that property, we'll use this property, uh, sorry, these property names. Yeah. So I'm gonna just select one of these objects. We don't want to have multiple uh, elements. I will, you know, flatten this because I just need one item. I I will hide it as well. So basically, I need to know you know, which are the properties for one of these items here. With a panel, I can visualize, you know, this list of, of parameters. And I can uh, notice that the ones I want are the overall height and overall width, which are indexed 16 and 17. Okay, so I just need a, a last list item. So I will uh, pick this from with a numeric value, I'm gonna pick here the number 16, right? Which corresponds to the height. If we connect this here, what comes out here is the property overall height, which is the one that we want to change. And uh, I could have another one for the well, uh, for overall width. But first, let's modify the height of these, of these objects. And in order to do so, I'm gonna use this visual arc under genetics set property value. As we can see here, we require an object. So I'm gonna use uh, these objects that come from here. The property is that property overall height, the one that I want to modify, and the value is the value that I already calculated before, which is the value, the height of the cell. I connect that here, and I can see that now the, um, well, the, um, these lovers take the proper height, but they still need to take the proper width. So I could repeat this process, you know, that taking the other operation, or I can just use this, uh, the same uh, component to also add the other parameter. So I know that the overall width corresponds to the, you know, the item number 17. So I'm gonna connect this next to the index. Now I've got an error because then the data structure here is different in each input. So I need to connect also here the values for the uh, widths. And I'm gonna hide you know, this original so everything looks as I, I decide. All right. So we've got here now these objects properly distributed according to this, uh, all this, this, this grid. Okay, we can have uh, different values in one direction or another. Um, all right, that there could be some fun stuff that we could do here. For example, we could change the aperture for each uh, louver, all right? And we could do it in a random, random way. So I'm gonna repeat this process, but in this case, I'm gonna pick, you know, the, um, the aperture property, which is the uh, number, Seven, uh, 14. So this would be the 14 uh, property. If I connect this here, I can see that I'm picking the aperture one. And now I could do the same thing, you know, 
changing this using the same uh, the same component, but in this case, I'm just going to use a, a new one to make it clearer. So I will uh, here connect this list of objects that already have the proper dimensions, the property is that one corresponding to the aperture, and as a value, I will calculate you know a random number of values uh, with a, a random component. So the range would be from zero to one, which corresponds to the percentage of aperture. The number should correspond you know to the number of items that I've got here. So I can uh, calculate this with a list length. Okay, I'm gonna flatten this. So as a result, I get the number 18 uh, number of items. So this will be the number and the city is something, you know, like a random, random value. These are the name, uh, well, all the all the values. And I need to graph this in order that the data structure that comes in each input is the same. Okay, I can hide these first objects. And now as a result, I will get, you know, louvers that have totally different uh, aperture from one to another. Let's bake that to see what we've got. We can actually now uh, hide the surface and we can see here our facade or shading system with totally different uh, aperture for each uh, object. All right, so something that we could do now is to uh, quantify these elements, okay? I'm gonna use the visual arc table command for that. But first, I need to create a table style that lets me list this object type. So if you right click on that object, on that icon, I'm gonna at least, well, we we've got already a few uh, styles, you know, available for different object types, but we don't have anyone for, for listing these louvers for elements. So I'm gonna click on the new table of style. I'm gonna call this uh, louvers, for example. Click next. I'm gonna select the object type to correspond to those objects, which is the element. And here I will add the different property fields that I want to include in this table. For example, we could uh, assign a name. In this wizard, uh, we don't find here the parameters that were generated from the original grasshopper definition, you know, that we used for this uh, for this style. We don't see that in this wizard, but we can see that uh, afterwards. So we'll create the property fields afterwards. In this case, we will just create the name and assign here the corresponding property. I click finish and now I'm gonna create a new property field. Okay, I can give it a name like width. And now I need to assign the corresponding parameter. So for this width, I need to tell which object type I want to list, which style I want to list because Depending on the style, we'll see a list of parameters or uh, other, another list. So select these louvers. And finally, the parameters can find also those corresponding to that style. In this case, I'm gonna select the width. And we can duplicate this, you know, this component because I will do the same for the height. So in this case, I can just select the height instead. And I will do the same with the aperture since this is a uh, parameter that is different from one to another, maybe it's worth it to to uh, show it in this table, you know, for each object. I find for this parameter in this list, and we are ready to create that uh, that table. So run the table command, select this louvers style, and select all these louvers, including those that we created before. All right, and we can see the different dimensions, of course, there are many of them with the same dimensions, except the first two that we created initially and the different aperture. But we see that the name, the, the name property is missing. Of course, these objects don't have a name. And you don't want to, you know, add this value one by one. So let's see how to create this in Grasshopper. So open that definition again. So we could repeat this process, you know, instead of a, you know, a property that is coming from this list, we could, uh, well, select the name one and, you know, create a new louvers with, with the proper names. But we don't want to, you know, get a duplicate copies of this object when we bake them. 
would like to bake only the, the property, not the geometry. And in order to do so, we've got a specific component called update property that will let us do this. So on one hand, we require to reference the object. So the object is something that um, we need to, you know, we need to uh, reference uh, from the model. In this case, I'm gonna, I could, you know, select this uh, element, but what I'm gonna do is use the pipeline, which will automatically, you know, select all the elements at once. So this will be my objects that I want to uh, update. Um, the property is the name. I mean, I could, you know, find the item of the of the name, which is the number one, or since this is a property, a native property, not a property generated in, in the grasshopper definition, um, I can find that list of properties with a specific component, which is this property name. These are the native, you know, visual art properties of uh, visual art objects, and that we the property we want to uh, to bake. And finally, as values, we can generate a list of calculated values according to the amount of items we've got here. So again, with a list length, uh, we can measure, you know, how many items we've got, and we can generate a list of numbers with a series component. So this is gonna start from uh, number zero, sorry, from number one. Um, the step would be one, and the count would be this total number of items. So as a result, we get you know a list of values that go from one to uh, twenty, and we can concatenate these numbers with some string, some string that could be uh, l dash, and we just need to use the concatenate component to take this fragment a with this list of numbers as fragment b, and as a result we'll get the list of names. Finally, we'll connect this into the value. We need to graph this to ensure that, you know, the data structure that comes in, sorry, is the same. And when I click on this update button, all the uh, names have been baked on the, on the geometry and only the names. We then get duplicate copies for each object, all right? And finally, since this uh, table is still linked with the geometry that was uh, referencing, we can just update it. And we can see you know, the, the name field uh, accordingly. Um, all right, so before finishing, I would like to show uh, some uh, another example of how these grasshopper components can be used uh, in, in Visual Arc. In this case, for producing uh, 2D drawings, um, actually, I'm going to open a document here that is used to generate automatic sections and elevation views. So one of the main features I was mentioning at the beginning of Visual Arc is the option to create, you know, plans, uh, 2D plans and section views. There is the option to do this, uh, you know, for our, with uh, with a hidden display mode, so we can show, you know. The model from uh, in plan view section, um, and using the you know the hidden display mode, we will we will be able to print what we see directly to to vector output, all right. Um, but there is another option to produce two drawings, which is a similar uh, command as the make to the random make to the command, but in this case we'll generate a two drawing that is linked with the with the model, and this two drawing actually is these commands are available here, the plan view and section view, um, are also available in, in Grasshopper. So I'm gonna show this Grasshopper definition. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna maximize it this way, which mm, I'm gonna recompute it. So basically this Grasshopper file references all the visual art objects, but also the Rhino geometry. Of course, here in the same model, we can combine visual art objects with Rhino, Rhino geometry. And based on the bounding box, I calculate here the position of section lines from which we will generate these section views. Okay, we've got one for each you know, elevation of the, of the model, 
and two cross sections to generate some uh, section of the of the model. So with these lines, we create section lines, and with these section lines, we can create section views. So just by you know calculating the insert points of these views and baking you know the section lines and the section views at the same time, you know we can generate with a few clicks all the uh, elevations and sections of our, our brush. All right. So we can see the progress bar to produce these two drawings. But after a few seconds, we'll see them generated. All right. So of course, these section lines correspond to the position of the, so these section views correspond to the position of the section lines. So for example, if we move that section view and we'll move it a little bit further so it doesn't intersect with the, you know, with the, with the wall of the of the ramp, later on we can come here and update this drawing. All right, so maybe there is time for some questions if you have any. Thank you, Frances. This was so much packed with information. I would hope there are some questions. <laughs> <laughs> So we're gonna we're gonna hang out here a few minutes. Uh, don't be shy. Thank you so much. This was um, I, you know, I bet uh, a few people will watch it again, and luckily they can do so because I've recorded everything. So and then I'll place everything on YouTube later on today. Um, and while we wait for potential question, Francesc, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take the screen back and show everybody right. where they can find the visual arc at novage.com. This is the product page. And uh, I want to remind everybody that Novage is changing the way designers purchase through this software. Uh, in fact, we have all the choices. You can buy visual arc and at the same time, Rhino or Lens Design and other compatible tools. And uh, you have the freedom to do so without reseller hopping. And we also can help you over the phone and everything is gonna go smooth and you won't even uh, have to be frustrated when you're purchasing your software. So um, check us out on veg.com. I don't see any question. You were so, okay, there's one. <laughs> okay, are there uh, annual lambs of folk seen more on struct okay any plans are there plans on focusing more on structural components um well there are a few components for you know for creating structural uh, objects uh we've got a library of you know uh, american and european profiles uh so i'm interested to know you know which features you know uh, you are more interested to to uh, to have in addition to those that are already available. You know, when we create uh, columns or uh, or beams, we've got, you know, a list of styles. In this case, we've got a rectangular uh, European, you know, sizes for, for beams. Uh, we can create these objects from curves. We can list these uh, objects. Of course, I'm interested to know, you know, which other features you miss from those that are available. Yeah, let us know if you uh, can think of any right now and uh, we'll still wait a few seconds. Do you, did you have anything in mind? Rilon, I think is the name of the person who asked. Well, okay. Um, Okay, the documentation for this is not that easy, he or she says. Do you mean the documentation for um, for beams or what do you mean? Annotating. For annotating. Well, for annotating, uh, 
Visualize takes advantage uh, mostly of Rhino drafting tools, you know, to to add, you know, dimensions, leaders, text. Um, but also Visualize provides some uh, well, tags, you know, they are uh, dynamic objects that are linked with object, with Visualize objects um, areas. And also these objects can be used to to uh, store, you know, blocks, to the blocks or dynamic blocks. Okay, for example, there are a few like this elevation mark that is also created from from a grasshopper style. So this uh, evaluates the you know the position of the object and shows you know the the proper elevation. Yes, thank you, Francesc. And another question is, um, what is the main benefit uh, of use of using Visual Arc? Um, for instance, you know, uh, compared to other tools, uh, what's the advantage of using of using Visual Arc in well, respect the main, Dynamo? The main or, advantage, yeah, it's the, the the option to work with BIM models in in Rhino. Okay, so in Rhino you have all the uh, flexibility to work with uh, freeform shapes, which is very uh, difficult to create in other in other programs. And you can add like beam features to to Rhino with uh, with visual objects and combine them with uh, with freeform shapes. Okay, and uh, if you need to produce documentation in Rhino, visual Art also uh, saves you a lot of time to produce these, you know, mm, dynamic blocks, dynamic uh, plan views or section views uh, that uh, is missing in, in in Rhino, or the option to work at different levels. It's uh, just a an easy way to work with architectural projects in Rhino. Uh, that again provides you the option to work with freeform uh, shapes, and also it links with Grasshopper with you know all these possibilities that I have shown today for parametric design with BIM elements. Right. Okay. Thanks, Francesc. Next question: um, Any plans on releasing? RCP views with Visual Arc 3, or you're waiting for the release of Rhino 8? Um, uh, reflect the same, same plant, I guess, right? Um, this is a, a feature plant for Visual Arc 3. Um, we're working on that. Uh, we don't know when we will release it, but uh, it's something that is, is scheduled and we, we yeah, will okay. be one of the new features of the new version. Okay, good news. And um, if I were to put this into Revit, how detailed would the details be? And can I change it with within Revit as well? Well, there are two options to export this model to Revit. One is the, maybe the easiest one, it's IFC. We save this, you know, uh, as using the IFC file format, and we open it in Revit. Uh, the problem is that some objects will be identified as native uh, Revit objects, but others don't. Okay, depending on the object type or how the objects have been created, uh, Revit will identify them as native objects or just geometry target as a wall or as a as a door. You know, for example, straight walls will uh, identify it in Revit as a you know, uh, native walls, but curved ones don't. Uh, or in the case of curtain walls or uh, stairs or other objects including these, you know, elements created from Grasshopper, uh, they get, you know, the proper object type tag. So Revit will identify them as stairs, curtain walls, or doors, but you won't be able to edit them in Revit as if you had created them, you know, uh, in Revit. The other way to export that model to Revit is through the uh, run site uh, technology. So basically, uh, from, Grasshopper from the Grasshopper definitions, you can extract, you know, data for these objects, and you can uh, well uh, generate native Revit objects with the uh, Revit Aware components in, in Grasshopper. And actually, in Food for Rhino, maybe I can I can uh, show you that. Sure. Very, Let me make you very quickly. Yeah. Um, there are some definitions. Okay. I'm gonna show this here. We've got some. Uh, I don't know if you see the. Yeah. the Food for Rhino website. Yeah, we've got some definitions available that already do all this conversation. Okay, so with this 
if you download this file, you can open it in Grasshopper and any model with visual objects you've got will be translated into Revit uh, automatically all at once. Or as it is it described in this video, uh, you can find, uh, you can, uh, let's say, load this Grasshopper file in Revit interface and, um, well, just with a pajama button, uh, get all the models ready in, in Revit. This is, you know, a project in, in Visual Arc created with, with Visual Arc objects where we've got also Rhino geometry. And since we, have, we are running Rhino and Grasshopper from Revit, we can, uh, well, insert here a, a pattern that basically uh, calls for a Grasshopper script that do all this conversion. Is a script that you can download from this button. And when we push this button, we get all the objects generated here. Okay, with all the data stored in the objects. And uh, well, in the case when it's possible, the objects are generated as true Revit objects. Okay, converting all the visual art styles as Revit families and object types. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Any plans on making the levels snappable in orthographic views? Well, that's a feature that is on our, our wish list. So okay. maybe if that person uh, sends us an email, I can I can let them know when, when the okay. feature is ready. Great. And uh, then we have some feedback. Um, mm -hmm. This uh, person thanks you for the presentation. And uh, he is saying that they use Visual Arc very often, but they notice the Rhino drafting capabilities gets cumbersome with large scale projects. And, uh, and so this is a, you know, my, my be cumbersome. And so, mm -hmm. so maybe something to look at in the future. Yeah, we are always interested to hear from this kind of feedback because of course, Visual Arc relies on, you know, Rhino capabilities to handle large projects or a large amount of uh, geometry. But we're always, you know, studying ways of optimizing this. So uh, maybe we can be in touch with this, uh, with this person if we can see options to improve this for particular uh, uh, projects. So we are always interested to improve that. And here's a Francesc email. So feel yeah. free to reach to out to him that. with all the feedback that you have. And that's yes. it for question. Thank you so much, Frances. This was uh, You're really intense and exciting. <laughs> and uh, thank you for attending, everybody. You can find Novaj everywhere. And go back on YouTube later today to rewatch this video. Uh, have a great rest of the day and night uh, if you're in the Frances time mm -hmm. zone. Thanks again for being sticking with us so late. And have a great thank you, um, rest of the day. Bye-bye. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.